tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Michelle Gonzalez, otherwise known as Dr. G. Dr. G graduated from the Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine in 1999 and obtained a master's degree in veterinary forensics from the University of Florida in 2017 and a master's degree in forensic psychology from Southern New Hampshire University in 2022. Dr. G owns a mobile practice, the Rascal Unit, that offers affordable and accessible sterilization and wellness care throughout the state of Ohio. And Dr. G also provides independent consultations and assistance on investigations of animal cruelty and neglect with both local and national organizations. She recently started an animal welfare podcast called The Animal Welfare Junction, which aims to provide both information on animal welfare topics as well as follow veterinary forensic cases. Dr. G, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much, Stacey, for having me. So first and foremost, before we jump into all of our conversation today, and, and for those of you who aren't able to see the video, we have, we have quality cat time happening right here, right now with Dr. G. So yes. why did you become passionate about cats? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because growing up, we were not allowed to have cats. My mom was afraid of cats. My sister was afraid of cats. So I grew up not knowing how awesome cats are. And when I went to college, it was the easiest pet to have was to have a cat. So oh, I got a cat. My first cat's name was Matthew, and he was amazing. So it just, that from there on, it was just love for, for cats. And, you know, even though I do like dogs, I do spend quite a bit of my time with cats. Excellent. So... You went on to veterinary school and you went into veterinary forensics. Was that just because you were passionate about animals in general, or was there something specific that took you in the direction of veterinary forensics? And some of our listeners might not even really know what that means. So, so basically veterinary forensics is the use of veterinary medicine in legal cases. So anything forensic has to do with the law applied to whatever field of study. So I've always been really interested in forensics and in crime, that kind of stuff. And I also like puzzles. So veterinary forensics is the perfect combination of the passions in my life, which is veterinary medicine and forensic uh, criminology type, type studies. And is that why you decided to create a podcast? So the podcast was partly because I like to educate people, right? We have a lot of individuals that make wrong decisions or do bad things, not because they're doing it on purpose. They're just ignorant or uneducated about something. So as veterinarians, we have to educate people uh, and in the concept of animal welfare for people to better take care of their, of their pets, they need to be educated. Also bringing up awareness of what things are out there because some of the problems that affect animals affect people, kind of like interpersonal violence. People that abuse animals are more likely to affect humans. So that to me was the importance of creating this podcast as a way for being able to let as many people as possible know what kind of things are happening in animal welfare. Yeah, I listened to one of your podcasts. Um, it was actually, it was about a hoarding situation, um, which I find extremely fascinating. Uh, I've gone through it several times in, in my past, working with folks that have gotten into trouble and have to work to get their cats down. And I, there's hoarding cases at a variety of different levels and and situations where, you know, there's workable and there's unworkable, you know, and then there's probably various levels in the middle what are your experiences working as a veterinarian going into a hoarding situation? And you're talking about people not, not knowing what's available. And I feel this might be a great silent generation of folks that they get themselves buried, basically, and they feel that they're stuck in this environment and not able to, to come out for a variety of ways, helping an animals, hoarding animals, 
hoarding shampoo bottles, hoarding other things too, in many cases, you know, how can we help these folks? I even say, how can we identify the near hoarder? How can we identify and get to them before they even become hoarders? So that was one of the biggest reasons for me to pursue the master's in forensic psychology is because I have a very strong interest in hoarding. And there are three different types of hoarders, right? We have the overwhelmed caregivers, which is the person that gets a cat here or there, and they have nowhere to take it, but they don't want anything wrong to happen to them. So they are, they're more than willing to part away with the animal. They just don't want anything wrong to happen to them. And then they get into that state of collecting animals. Then you have the rescuer hoarder. And those are the people that actually have a mental health condition. So usually the rescuer hoarders are collecting animals and they tend to also collect objects. So they fall into that category of of OCD uh, and mental health disease. So what, what I have found, I have worked in both cases. I have gone into the homes of overwhelmed caregivers and they are very welcoming. As soon as they find out that I'm there to help, that I'm that I'm not looking to just kill their animals or depopulate them, they're very welcoming. They invite me into the home. They're very receptive to the recommendations that we make. And they want us to take as many cats away or dogs away as possible. I say cats because the majority of hoarders that we work with, of overwhelmed caregiver hoarders, tend to be cats. The rescuer hoarders are a completely different story. The, you usually need to have law enforcement involved because they don't recognize the damage that they're causing to the animals. They don't recognize the damage that they're causing to themselves. They don't want to part with the animals. They feel that they are the best caretaker for those animals. So it becomes a, a big problem getting those animals removed from that bad condition. And then following up, these cases are processed through the through the legal system and the biggest problem that I see is that the mental health part of it is not addressed as strongly as it should. So they go into court and they get fees and fines and they get probation where they cannot have animals for five years. But the underlying problem that caused them to hoard is not taken care of. So in five years time, the the guess is that they're going to do it again because animal hoarding has near 100% recidivism which means that they are very likely to do it again if they do not receive any mental health help. Wow, I didn't know it was that high. I was always a strong believer when I dealt with a uh, hoarding situation is that that person was going to become my best friend. And it was not just a one and done situation. It was, you know, I checked in with them every three or four months. I wanted to assure them that our local resources were the place that when people came to them and said, Hey, I've got a cat, I need you to help with my cat, that they would be like, Oh, well, go down the street to the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. They're great. They're going to help you. They'll make sure you get your cat gets what needs to, you know, happen for that cat, rather than go, Oh, what's one more, I'll just take another one in. And so to have that sort of relationship with them ongoing, it's a lifelong partnership, really. And that was sort of the relationship that I tried to create with a lot of um, folks that did get in trouble. And there, and I ran into the caretaker side as well as the, the rescuer side, which was, I know I, well, in some cases, they, they were like, I know I should get my numbers down, but there's just, they need me so badly. I'm, and I'm the only one who can do this for them. And there's that letting go. And I agree that there's just so much that, needs to go on in that process of rehabilitation that um, yeah. our, our staff, or at least in my situation, our staff was not prepared for any of that. You know, you come into these environments and you think, oh, I'm here for the cats, but there's so much people stuff that goes on there. How do you prepare your team when you go into a, an environment like that? So the first thing is, again, depending on if it's an overwhelmed caregiver versus a rescue hoarder, it is a completely different dynamic. So the overwhelmed caregivers are a little bit easier for the staff to go into because they know that they're going in, they're helping. They, they They know not to be judgmental. Everybody that works for us understands that this is something that unfortunately just happens over time, right? It's not like one day they're living clean and then the next day they're in filth. 
is something that is very gradual. So understanding the the process of how somebody gets into that condition helps us go in in a way to help. With the rescuer hoarders, it tends to be more problematic because they're, we're not welcome. Uh, this the Athens case that I that I discuss in my podcast. When we went in, that lady was yelling at us. She even started throwing things at us because she did not want us there. So it's uh, in in that regard, it's more about the safety of our staff, the safety of of everybody involved, and following things through the legal system to remove the person to get medical care for that person and then take care of the animals. Uh, one of the differences as well is with overwhelmed caregivers, you want to remove the all the animals that they cannot take care of, but they do enjoy the companionship of the animals. And you do want to let them keep some animals. You want to let them keep that those animals that they can care for within their means. A rescuer hoarder, it's a little bit different where you have to be really careful with if you leave animals because you know that they're not providing help and they think that they are so the the mental health is just not there how do we find these folks before they get overwhelmed honestly i don't know that there is a good way to find them before that because the first people that that realize that there's a problem it tends to be family and i think that the family just gets fed up with it like they themselves try to help and they're like you know, in, in the case of the children, they'll say, mom, you, you have too many cats. You got to do something about it. Well, if you, you don't clean up the place, we're, we're not coming back or we're not bringing the kids back in. And they isolate them more and more and more. So I think it's very, very difficult to identify hoarders before they become hoarders. Do you need expert help taming feral kittens for adoption? Watch the Taming Feral Kittens and Cats full-length workshop video now available for free on the Urban Cat League YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com and search Urban Cat League to see all of their videos to benefit community cats. Do you want to make things easier on yourself and the others in your organization? Our friends at Dubert have teamed up with the Dallas Pets Alive and Spay Neuter Network teams, and together they have created the Companion Case Management Module. It allows you to be more proactive with all your organization's needs, create cases for your clients and organize them by type. Whether it is a rehoming situation, a pet parent needing food or medical assistance, or simply spay and neuter inquiries, CCM can help you manage all of them right from the Dubert system. Plus a huge bonus, it allows you to connect with those clients right from the case so there is no need to open up new windows for emails or pull out your phone for text messages. Check it out and learn more at www.dubert.com to get started today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. Do you think access to care plays an issue? I'm getting the sense here in New England, before the pandemic, when we had a lot of available high volume, high quality spay neuter opportunities, the number of hoarding situations that would become apparent over the course of the year seem to be going down pretty significantly. And in the last year or so, from my perspective, and this is not scientifically analyzed, I feel like there are more hoarding situations that are, or more of these 100 to 120 cat intakes, you know, coming in than there were for a period of time. It would make sense to me that access to care or the access to spay neuter, it's yet another barrier, makes it harder again. So it's another reason for these folks to kind of stay under the radar. I don't know if that's something you're seeing in Ohio. I think that access to care is a huge problem everywhere. And we do see it quite a bit in Ohio. And I think that it is a big part of why overwhelmed caregivers become hoarders. We recently uh, were approached by a lady that just had a handful of cats. They were not fixed. And from what she's telling me, she has close to 90 cats in her house. And she came to us asking for help because she said she's been trying to get them fixed, but she cannot afford to pay 
uh, the, the cost to sterilize that many cats. And also she cannot find the place to sterilize that many cats in, in the time that it would take to prevent them from reproducing. So, yeah, I think that access to care has a huge impact in the creation of overwhelmed caregiver hoarders. So you operate uh, several mobile spay, neuter and wellness clinics. So you want to tell us a little bit about that program? Yeah, absolutely. In 2006, I opened, I founded the Rascal Unit, which is a mobile sterilization clinic providing high quality, high volume sterilization throughout the state of Ohio. So we go anywhere within state lines. Um, we have over time grown. So it started with one truck and now we have three trucks and there's a fourth truck on the way to replace the older trucks that have been on the road so long that they're starting to break down. Uh, but yeah, we travel everywhere just providing affordable and accessible care, especially in rural areas of Ohio. So those areas that we would consider deserts, which are the places that have lack of resources, we travel to those areas and we bring to the community the sterilization help and the wellness care, vaccine care that they need. And how many do you do cats and dogs or just cats? We do cats and dogs and we do a handful of rabbits as well. There's not a lot of places that do rabbits and especially uh, at a low cost, at an affordable cost. So I would say we do about 100 rabbits every year. But uh, last year, we did a little bit, I believe, around 13,000 surgeries throughout the, the entire state. The majority of the surgeries are cats, but we do a pretty close uh, number as far as cats versus dogs. And we did close to about 2,000 community cats. And the way that we trace that is we keep track in our computer system of how many ear tips we do. So that's our rough way of evaluating how many how many community cats we've done. It, the actual number is higher because unfortunately there are people out there that think that tipping a cat is cruel, but we feel that tipping a cat is actually not cruel. It helps prevent the you know the same cat from com coming back in. It saves on resources, saves on time, and saves on the stress to the poor cat that has to be in that predicament more than one. So. When using your mobile clinic, I know at the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society with our Catmobile, we will sometimes drive up to a trapper's location or trapper's house, or if we've used fire departments with heated bays to do a, a TNR you know, event for that day and have recovery off the truck. Do you do anything like that? Or do you do the situation where there's like cages in the truck and you're, you know, you've got them stacked very conveniently in the in your unit so it's a combination of things everywhere that we travel to we travel with a host um, organization so it will be either a shelter or a humane organization that asks us to come to their community to provide the service so everything is a, a team type uh, event so we will travel to that location and the hosting group is actually responsible for scheduling the appointments the reason we do it that way is that each individual location knows what they need for their community. It's unrealistic for me to say, I know what this county needs because I don't live there. I don't see their problems. However, the shelter, the local sh shelter knows what the problem is. So some places will schedule cat only clinics, dog only clinics, combination clinic, rescue only animals, community animals. We just tell them what we require for our clinic day and then we let them um, schedule the appointments. Interesting. That's great. Tell me a little bit more about your your podcast. What sort of topics are, are you planning on covering? I know there were some behavioral topics in there. So, you know, what do you foresee for this podcast going forward? So the first couple of episodes were on affordable and accessible care, the importance about it, how it is important for people, especially underserved individuals to have the companionship of an animal for their own mental health and why it's important to them be able to provide access to care. Uh, the second one was on the effect of the veterinary shortage, how it is affecting individuals, how it's affecting shelters, how it's affecting veterinary clinics. And then we had a behavioral euthanasia uh, podcast that was actually a request from one of our listeners. That's a topic that they wanted to listen to. So then we had individuals that have been affected by the concept of behavioral euthanasia. So the idea of it is to find topics that are important to the community 
things that the, the public in general have questions about, and then invite different groups, different groups of people to be part of the interview process. So that's why it's called an animal welfare junction, because we have different disciplines coming together to figure out these cases. So for instance, on the first episode that we had, I had a community psychologist that came to us to explain the view of affordable and accessible care from the human side of it, right? So there's there's a lot of different fields that come together for the welfare of humans and animals. So that's the whole idea of it. And that's why it's called the animal welfare junction, because it's where everything comes together. Great. Sounds like it's uh, it's excellent. It's an excellent place to be. I'm so excited to see new podcasts um, come out and be be produced on this topic because the more that we can be talking about this, the better we're all going to be. Um, and and I think it's really wonderful to talk about this the strategy and what's going on with the general public. I can talk about a veterinary shortage, a technician shortage, just general staffing shortage. And most of the general public has no idea. There are folks that take my trapper certification workshops that we have on a, on a monthly basis. 70% of those folks are just out there trying to trap a cat or two in their backyard. They're not involved with any sort of an animal welfare organization. And they reach out. They're frustrated. They can't get a vet appointment. They can't get an affordable one. They can't get one even for, you know, $400 in New York City. As a veterinarian, you know, what are you seeing with regards to the, the stresses in the veterinary community? So it, it is a stressful, not just from the veterinary side, but also from the veterinary technician side. Now, I am extremely grateful for the fact that I have technicians that have been with me for many, many years because they believe in what we do. They are appreciated. I believe in having technicians do everything that they are legally allowed to do. So they come in and they practice to the extent of their, their licensing. But not having enough veterinarians does decrease the amount of reach that we can have. Right now, we have two trucks that are actually on the road, and I have two doctors, and we have a huge backup list of people that, that need appointments. And Anytime that we open an appointment, we have an online system for appointments. And as soon as we open it within an hour, the clinic is completely full. And that, you know, from a business standpoint, that's a great problem to have. But from a personal standpoint, it's really sad to know that the need is so huge and we cannot serve it. So, yeah, the not being able to to provide service to everybody that needs it, it does take a toll on on everybody. So, Dr. G, if you had a magic wand, you could do whatever you wanted for for cats, because we are talking about community cats here. What would your magic wand do for them across the country? I mean, I would have rascal units all over the place providing sterilization, wellness care, everything that they need, uh, especially TNR, you know, just... Being able to to go to the places that we are needed uh, and not have to, to worry about not having enough doctors and not having enough trucks to do so. Excellent. If uh, folks are interested in finding out more about the Animal Welfare Junction podcast, how would they do that? So we have a Facebook page page, the Animal Welfare Junction podcast page. We have a website that is forensics.vet, V-E-T. And on there, we have links to the uh, Animal Welfare Junction. The Animal Welfare Junction podcast is available on most podcast providers. So um, people can find us in, in any of those. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Uh, the, the Animal Welfare podcast is for the community. So for us to be able to give the information that we need to, you know, requests are always welcome. So anybody can go into the Animal Welfare Junction podcast Facebook page and give us a comment on things that they would like to listen to. And maybe a future podcast would be based on their request. Excellent. Dr. G, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope we'll have you on the show in the future. Thank you so much, Stacey. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. 
You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Bye.